Okay, so we got 2 p.m. in Geneva, and uh, I welcome everybody who found uh, an opportunity and chance and uh, whatever it is to join us. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for finding time for us to hear our credit chat, which is credit chats which is our program dedicated to discussions with um, different kind of specialists related to credit management. To, um, I am Andrei Sichka, uh, head of credit engineering, and I'm uh, very pleased to welcome today um, my co-discussioner and co-speaker, and I'm very, very honored to have him today is Vladimir Rano. He is the uh, economist of. Um, no. He's the economist from University of uh, of Vienna and uh, any se several other several other academical institutions. But uh, Vladimir, <laughs> I believe you 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 are allowed. You, you, I would be. I would ask you. Or I'm allowed to ask you a couple of words about yourself. How you define yourself? Because. Mm -hmm. We, we, we had, we got many, many common acquaintances. I know you were um, speaking on the credit management conferences. So you are quite close to the area of credit management. Therefore, I actually allowed myself to contact you. But how would you define yourself? Uh, because I know you got many titles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, Formerly, at the moment, I'm a member of the supervisory board and member of the audit committee of the Slovak Export Import Bank. I also advise the Ministry of Finance in Bratislava in Slovakia. Basically, my experience spans over 20 years in macroeconomic research, chiefly focusing on Central and Eastern Europe, which basically, in my most recent 10 years, stand with the uh, European subsidiary of the spare bank meant from mm -hmm. the Warsaw all the way to Sarajevo and from the Prague all the way to Kiev. Uh, so that's briefly it. Clear. And uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned at least two banks in your background. So this means that you been, let's call it maybe incorrectly, incorrectly uh, terrorist. You are quite close to practice. Practice of country risk, country risk assessment, so on, so on. So I believe you enjoy this, I would say, edge between theory and practice. Is that, would it be correct uh, about you? Absolutely, Andre. Uh, uh, I'm uh, using the quotes from my former colleagues. I'm this theoretician academic in the yes. uh, corporate world. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher an economist, but uh, my research experience has been in the commercial uh, sector. So, so basically well, what I try to do, I to try to convince uh, the very uh, practically minded and bottom line minded uh, commercial people about why they should take into account all those theories uh, floating out there in the academic world, which in the good times is not uh, that easy. On the, luckily for me, as an economist, uh, we have this inevitable cycle, uh, macroeconomic cycle of, uh, cycle of crisis and recessions repeating. Basically, nobody needs the expertise that I possess uh, during the good times because the future is bright. Uh, everybody knows that. On the other hand, these re recurrent uh, crises and recessions then all of a sudden remind the need to understand the underlying no, trends and underlying developments Development. and risks. Yes, that's uh, actually that what this, this is very similar to what credit management is. Obviously, um, growth of the company as well as the growth of the economy is you know, mainly means we need to sell. We need to sell more products. We need to grow our economy. But this does not automatically mean that we receive cash. That's what, by the way, credit management is. That's where we got our actually source of our job. 
Yeah, selling is one part which is important. This is supposed to be um, supported mm -hmm. only by the finance, but at the same time, we need to take care of risk. Um, and uh, to me, right today, actually, I once again uh, published my video where um, normally people uh, used to believe that credit risk is mostly associated with bankruptcy of a customer. And I actually tried to discover in this video, in the, this short article, that bad debts happen at least in, in at least five different scenarios. And bankruptcy is only one of them. Another important matter is country risk, because whatever good or bad every counterpart is, this company or entity, or we, 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 we may name it business uh, in most wide terms, is always affected by the economy it operates in. And uh, obviously, we may see it uh, most brightly and most clear when we do export and import transaction. But if, if I can ask you as, a, as, 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 a, as an academic, what is the degree of impact, uh, to elaborate a bit in practical terms, what is the degree um, of impact on the entity, on the company, from the economy it operates in? Well, this is when we speak in terms of the uh, corporate people, uh, mm -hmm. something that they all uh, are most acquainted with is this uh, SWOT analysis and within this strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, the, the country analysis is something that sure. relates to the external opportunities and external threats. That's the most simple uh, definition using the language of the... Of the uh, Microeconomics, uh, corporate, sure. uh, corporate uh, salespeople. Uh, let's put it uh, this way. But uh, to put it very bluntly, mm -hmm. uh, there is now very uh, up to date example of the Brexit. Uh, I, I yeah. must remind. Which first, first of all, nobody believed could have happened before the referendum. Then for three years there was this really. Uh, cycle of uh, denial, trying to underplay the impact of, of uh, this decision, mm -hmm. which has been dragging on. And as a result, the most recent news that we get from the exporters in the Great Britain are that some of them are really hit by 40-50% the drop in their exports. Now, by which, yes, uh, as I mentioned in uh, my first comment, in the good times, nobody believes in the necessity to put uh, more uh, detailed assessment to the external environment, to these threats and opportunities coming from the macroeconomic and country analysis. Um, but nevertheless, it's the, it's the crisis which reminds us uh, the importance that it can have. Basically, to the question, why is it important to do uh, country analysis, why is it important to do macroeconomic analysis? Mm -hmm. A very blunt answer is uh, macroeconomic or country analysis is about uh, not losing money, uh, the, the, yes. the op opportunity costs uh, that yes. happen in the worst case scenarios. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also about earning money, not only in investments, but also in properly setting up something that you mentioned, properly setting up the payment uh, conditions associated with the transactions with a uh, with particular country. And also when I speak about not losing money, uh, we can't avoid uh, in nowadays environment, uh, direct investments, mm -hmm. uh, huge, huge, we, so something that we have learned during the past year of the COVID crisis that this uh, global supply chain of just in time, uh, interconnections uh, can be fragile and can pose a risk. So what we will inevitably need to do is more of the nearshoring, mm -hmm. more of the facilities that will be established in not only the most cost efficient uh, locations like yeah, Eastern 
uh, Asia, uh, but in closer locations, which might appear also uh, more palatable from the viewpoint of the cost. Uh, but again, there is no free lunch. So uh, no free lunch in terms of the macroeconomic and country analysis means that uh, more palatable, more attractive cost is that there must be, there must be a catch somewhere. And that catch usually is in those underplayed, uh, uh, underestimated uh, macroeconomic, uh, political, um, or uh, the uh, external stability uh, risks that are associated with uh, such locations. That's why uh, it's worthwhile uh, to put a more detailed attention uh, to analyzing the uh, areas we do business with, uh, either through trade transactions or uh, through uh, investments. Sure, and uh, as you mentioned, um, supply chain, I did that, that you know, um, made me recall uh, the simple rule, the one of the first rules of the supply chain, uh, which is efficiency is coming, always coming with the higher risk. So we may have less uh, like in just in time delivery. We may have less money, you know, restricted in warehouse. But then we got higher risk of having no goods or no, no no raw materials to produce goods, and this is another risk. And this this risk may be higher. So this is this is uh, one of the thing. And thanks for mentioning Brexit because. Mm, honestly speaking, we used to, you know, I personally used to look at United Kingdom as something like, you know, famous Mark Knopfler song. It's United Kingdom or Britain as sure as the sunrise. But once again, as soon as the Brexit came, uh, that was, I mean, we could not call it unexpected scenario because that was everything on, on media, we were here, but nobody believed, but it happened. And then it's a question, how do we assess credit risk, uh, actually country risk, and obviously what you mentioned with, uh, with Eastern Asia, we know that, okay, the cost, production cost there is, is quite low, but at the same time, there are higher country risk, all these political issues and stuff like that. My favorite example is Mauritius, where uh, Ralph Lauren established full-fledged production, then everything has been nationalized. And all these mega million dollars were set and they still produce goods under the, under the, brand, uh, under the brand of Ralph Lauren, so you can come there and buy. Okay, okay, these are models of 80s, I think, but this is it. Uh, and uh, from your researches and from your view, um, when we talk about trade transaction, maybe trade in transaction, not really investment one, but when we, we send goods or we, we purchase goods, sending out advance payments, obviously there are there are different terms of, 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 on how this could be done, but let's say this would be open credit simply good sent uh, without bankering, without any sort of guarantee or insurance or advanced payment sent out in terms of purchasing, which is the same, the, the same credit as, as, as any other. Um, in terms of country risk, um, what, on your view, what are the most dangerous scenarios for the exporters and importers? Because we, we, we all know that risk is coming by this scenario. I know mm -hmm. that oh, the most famous scenario on my side and the most, you know, so quickly, uh, quickly coming or quickly happening, uh, sorry for my bad English, uh, is actually convertibility risk when the company or your counterpart in foreign or overseas has pockets full of money but unable to, to pay because this is this everything in local currency and, you know, there, there is no either no access to hard currency to pay export con contract or, um, or there is, uh, you know, the, 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 the effects rate is quite high. 
That's one of the examples. Uh, maybe there are others. I mean, obviously, political scenario could be could be difficult. Uh, I mean, it is really impossible to manage, but that's another example. So what are your favorite examples? Again, in terms of probability and in terms of impact, whatever you would choose. Mm -hmm. The more uh, very, famous very scenarios. Good. Thank you, Andre. Very good and very important questions. Uh, very directly to your uh, question about uh, examples, very practical Don't examples. Don't need to be politically would, correct with me. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> lucky, lucky. You can lucky, be direct, we both are both Yeah, uh, well, uh, let's let's use the three examples of, mm -hmm. uh, of for example, what we have mentioned, uh, UK, uh, Greece, or Turkey, or mm -hmm. very respectable, relatively uh, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, countries. So what you mentioned, the convertibility risk is something that we considered something to be the matter of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, we see that it does not uh, all develop as easily. Basically, the same period which made most of the people negligent about the inevitability of the uh, economic cycles. And that was this period from the beginning of the 90s until the uh, the beginning of the millennia the, until the uh, global crisis hit after the, after the Lehman Brothers in uh, September 2009. Uh, that same period made people also negligent about the country specific, for example, the convertibility risk and currency risk. Basically, I remember well that before 2009, the status quo or the dom dominant expectation concerning the uh, country analysis and, uh, uh, for example, the convertibility risk analysis was that in, and that, that was a strong belief back in 2007, 8, 9, was that eventually all the countries of the European Union will adopt Euro. Basically, it was just considered a matter of time. And there were all these scoring mm -hmm. uh, tables, uh, just judging when will new member states uh, fulfill the Maastricht criteria and they, mm -hmm. they will enter into the IRM, IRM uh, scheme and when they adopt Euro, what we have seen after 2009 was that uh, that scenario is now uh, less up, likely uh, up, I would say. Up, up the chimney. Yes. Uh, well, it's 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 nowhere on on the radar, uh, frankly. I mean, even after we solve all the uh, problems at hand, we understand that we will need to reform the eurozone uh, and reform the European Union, its political structure uh, and fiscal structure. Let's be honest, uh, before we can really consider any any expansion. So we, we can see that this uh, convertibility risk or with uh, countries outside of the common uh, European uh, currency block mm -hmm. has uh, risen. Very particular uh, reminder of that worst case scenario is the, the, the Greece. Again, uh, a full-fledged member of the Eurozone. It's a different story yes. on what political grounds that membership has happened. But nevertheless, there we have seen the cases where even the full-fledged subsidiaries of perfectly operating multinational corporations with uh, perfectly viable and profitable products were hit by uh, simply the uh, currency uh, or the uh, restrictions on the you know, payment uh, the payments abroad uh, then another less severe consequence is what we have seen in past uh, weeks actually uh, last uh, this month uh, that was the case of turkey where the, uh, the tailspin or the sharp depreciation of the uh, Turkish lira was triggered by the political uh, decision. And speaking of something that you also asked in your question about the political risk, because political risk is considered something that can not be quantified, especially mm -hmm. this uh, uh, mathematical-minded uh, salespeople and controlling people mm -hmm. uh, tend to underplay this political risk as something like wishy washy. He said, uh, she said, nevertheless, in my 20 years of experience, there are ways how to uh, quantify uh, the political risk, how to put it into charts and models. 
and try to assess the risks associated. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, what, what you mentioned even, yeah, the Brexit was uh, considered something uh, not possible uh, to happen. But when one looks in detail into the structure of the electorate of uh, individual uh, parties, uh, when we look, for example, into the details of the constituencies of the mm -hmm. major political parties, and when we then analyze in retrospect the motivations for actually putting up that vote uh, up for the decision, then we see it's, uh, it's less of a surprise. Um, there have been previously discussions, which I wouldn't underplay, about some other member countries uh, of the European Union leaving, which was again, uh, because of this prevailing, uh, I dare to say wishful thinking, we all hope for the best, but the job of yes. the people in your position, uh, the job of the people in the, well, for example, credit management is to plan for the worst. And these are the, this is the, this major dichotomy, which makes this kind of discussions very unpopular. But uh, when, when one looks at the motivations of the individual political parties and uh, their predominant motivation is to survive and to get reelected, one uh, must, be, must be careful about uh, such risks also elsewise. Uh, one such recent reminder was, for example, the, the, the dynamics between the Brussels, the, the, the European Commission, and some of the Eastern, uh, Eastern member countries were much to the surprise, Absolutely. in my opinion, of the, some of the Western analysts. Uh, they uh, woke up to the realities that apart from the undeniable economic benefits of the, the biggest and the most lucrative uh, common market in the world, which is the European Union, and beyond the uh, undeniable and uh, clear uh, benefits of membership in the uh, European Union. After time, people people get used to good uh, things very easily, and then, then they tend to underplay the risks. And uh, as we say in Slovak, uh, when uh, when a goat is happy, it goes to dance on the thin ice. And that's, that's, for example, something that we are observing in terms of some of the political risks that are rising in the, in, uh, especially in Eastern EU member states. And then when you look at the, the overall, not, not only the, the, let's say the worst case scenario of the currency depreciation risk or convertibility risk, uh, but also let's put it bluntly as the uh, prospects for the country remaining member of the club, e e even if rationally, uh, it's, it's a clear cut that the membership in the EU, uh, uh, case of Slovakia and Slovenia also proves that membership in the Eurozone, the common currency area, brings uh, clear cut uh, benefits at the end of the day, and that's the that's very same as also in the in the corporations. Corporations mm -hmm. are no different from the states. The decisions in corporations, as well as in states, are not being made by the super cool, super rational, uh, uh, yeah. uh, so clearly structured computers. The decisions are made by people, and people are unfortunately uh, susceptible to emotions, uh, to fears. To fear and greed, uh, let's put it this this, this way, uh, and that can then uh, skew the uh, skew the decision making. By which I basically want to point uh, to, uh, for, for for example, and and then uh, this this uh, uh, this um, this unoptimal decisions tend to uh, there is the Murphy's law, joking law that. When things can go bad, they do. <laughs> and uh, moreover, when, they, when, they, when, 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 when uh, things, mm, and, and that, that's again not, not, not a joke that goes from the 
behavioral finance, something that we do observe and that we have already uh, also formalized in the financial markets that mm -hmm. things tend to develop in the waves. There are waves of optimism, there are chain waves of sequence of events which are optimistic and are positive, but then there is also a reverse chain of uh, events in the pessimistic uh, way, which is something that when things uh, can go wrong, they do and then they too uh, go wrong in clusters. So uh, that's something uh, from my viewpoint that has happened in the case of the, the UK in the vote about the vote on. Um, yeah. the Brexit leaving. Uh, then that's something that happened uh, recently in, in, in Turkey when you are in a difficult uh, situation as a high-ranking politician, the probability that you, mm -hmm. that you panic and do some other unoptimal uh, decisions is higher, which we have seen with the nominations for the, uh, for the governor of the Central Bank of Turkey, even though that risk has been uh, expected and anticipated, except that it has not been accept, expected in such a uh, very short uh, time frame. So when we speak about the, the political stability risk that is uh, inevitably associated with the government effectiveness risk, uh, as well as the legal and regulatory risk, uh, which eventually leads to foreign trade and uh, and uh, payment payment risk, which yeah, to, to sum it up, helps to explain how is how is it possible that uh, regardless of all the all the issues, the U.S. dollar remains uh, such a golden standard of the yeah. global trade and global finance, and that's basically because of the track record of over two hundred fifty years of a continuous. Uh, stable political and 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 uh, government uh, development, uh, of it, which which helps to underpin uh, the status of the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency and all the associated benefits, regardless of the fact that if you would judge the U.S. some other uh, aspects of the U.S. macroeconomic stability. Uh, many other countries would not be able to survive. Another good example of, mm -hmm. of that, of that, like we've spoken about the bad, uh, bad apples, such as yeah. E even though Turkey is a fantastic and absolutely uh, certainly economy to be in and economy to do business with, uh, also from the viewpoint of European Union or from the viewpoint of the potential. When you look at the demog demography, it's uh, very likely that in 20 years um, the Turkey will be in terms of the population somewhere on the par with Russia uh, which will force us to rethink this acronym of BRICS uh, and yes. most certainly to uh, consider uh, in the time frame to include Turkey in that uh, window but there are the issues which which the country needs to solve itself but on the other spectrum of the positive examples in a very rocky uh, neighborhood is the Japan. Again, when you look at the, at the public debt of uh, yes. Japan and other classic issues. example. It's a very they classic had, they, example. They, they had, yeah, you, you, you see, first of all, the, the political system, which is, which is uh, rather, rather robust and, and stable. Uh, mm -hmm. But then, then you also have some, some particular decisions but again, here I would like to undermine the fact that the, the fact how the Japanese pension funds uh, do invest and do underpin the Japanese government in their purchase of the government bonds is influenced by the uh, regulations concerning their, their investments. Uh, but at the end of the day, also the, the local preferences uh, of, of the decision makers in the financial sector who then, together with the central bank and with the regulator, formed a consensus about what might or might be, not be uh, the best course of action. Again, from the viewpoint of the, uh, for example, the Western uh, Western pension manager, uh, mm -hmm. you would say, no, you, you are supposed to diversify the macroeconomic risks. So if you are a country 
dependent on how the macroeconomy of Japan is doing. Out of the textbook, many of the uh, analytics dealing with the pension systems would say that in order to diversify the risk of your own uh, country, you should invest your pension savings somewhere uh, abroad. Elsewhere, uh, yeah. Uh, but we see we we see that that that's not what the Japanese uh, pension funds are doing, and uh, the flip side of that is that the uh, government and the country can uh, survive even on what in other cases would be unsustainable level of debts, which uh, nominally are really comparable with some of the uh, African uh, countries. So uh, again, just to sum it sum it up. Um, it's uh, e even something that is considered uh, not that easy to quantify risk can be quantified. Mm -hmm. There are several of the methodologies how to quantify it, uh, not only the macroeconomic, but also the legal and regulatory risk, government effectiveness risk, uh, and the uh, political stability risk, uh, which are worth uh, looking at. And as I, as I mentioned, uh, if I would have mentioned this, this exit topic mm -hmm. with some of the other uh, member states, uh, not only because of the wishful thinking, but also because of the, of the logic, logic viewed from the outside, uh, yes. people would say exiting European Union makes no sense and that therefore it would not happen. But that's the way you look from the outside and assess uh, uh, objectively, relatively objectively, the circumstances of the country in question. When you look at the situation from the inside, from the capital of the country, and from the viewpoint of the major political players who have to make decisions on the basis of their very subjective assessment sitting in that uh, country and being surrounded by the electorate and by their stakeholders, you might end up with, uh, with some of the uh, unoptimal scenarios uh, happening uh, that, uh, as, as we have seen, uh, for example, in the, in the case of either London or Ankara. O on the other hand, we have seen again, not to speak only about the bad examples, again, uh, that was um, very recently, I mean, in my brief you know, 20 years of uh, career, I only uh, experienced three crises at the turn of the millennia, then 2009, yes. 10, uh, 2012, the, the euro crisis and recent. But just just to very briefly sum up, mm -hmm. uh, the the Greek government made a suicidal fiscal uh, uh, fiscal consolidation measures, very, uh, really, literally suicidal measures. Can you please elaborate uh, a little bit about that? Uh, because uh, uh, that included that included uh, cuts in uh, uh, in pensions, that mm -hmm. including severe cuts in the public sector employment and salaries, mm -hmm. that including included very radical regulatory uh, decisions which disrupted mm -hmm. some of the industries which were protect overprotected by the. Uh, unionized uh, arrangements okay, uh, that included a significant narrowing of or, or of the budget budgetary expenditures. But why I mentioned that, they did that. Uh, uh, a friend of mine from the Slovak Academy of Sciences does say says that people only do the right thing once they are on their knees and bleeding from the knees. Yeah. Uh, and that was and that yeah. was the that was the, the the case of Greece. The 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 dangerous thing is that that was uh, that could have developed also uh, otherwise. The other scenario, which I believe at that point, the two hundred years of the continuity in the mm -hmm. political elites of Greece uh, did understand. The other scenario would have have made the the both the country and all its citizens a much worse off uh, uh, than than what 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 they did. Uh, but and, and again, they slipped into that situation uh, again because of the external crisis. But external crisis 
hits or drags uh, uh, into this uh, unsustainable situation uh, those players that are uh, not prepared well. And again, this underlines the my my in, initial opening statement why it's important to pay attention to the country risk and macroeconomic risk because it's about uh, not only earning money but also not losing money and Actually, as we now have learned this inevitability of re recurrent um, recessions and crises uh, means that if you do business in a in in in, in a territory which we which we fundamentals the odds are higher uh, that that territory might on a relatively short notice end up in a in a difficult place and and, and again uh, back back in 2019 i was one of the mm. very few who were warning about the risk of the recession yes you could say that nobody could have uh, forecasted the uh, pandemic uh, nevertheless they have been for example shortly at, uh, yes. at, at, at the at the end of the at the end of 2019 uh, there was so called black swan index uh, again the quantified indicator of uh, risk that something unpredictable might happen uh, this black swan index was warning uh, that something uh, dangerous might happen the moody's analytics one of these prominent providers of the country risk huh? assessment uh, had on their list of the 20 major uh, catalyst of the next uh, recession, they had the re-emergence of the swine flu uh, in the autumn of uh, 2019. Now, in retrospect, but that was predicted. It, it it was not the swine flu, but the but, risk yes. of non non economic, non political healthcare yeah. uh, uh, crisis was something that was on the radar. Sure. And, uh, you know, uh, you actually gave me, you know, you made my head full of insights. Let, 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 me, let, let, us, let, us, let, let us elaborate a bit on that because, you know, in general, people used to think that risk is something, um, I mean, our human nature presumes that the risk is something which is, which is, a bad scenario which is happening right now like you know you you put you put your finger into the fire and you you, and you feel pain it's not like this yeah you may keep your your finger in 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 the fire you know sometimes for a week sometimes for a minute sometimes for a year but one day there, there will be a pain because you just put your finger into the fire this means that these are the money money and the risk are the money you can lose any moment and normally as you rightly mentioned, uh, Murphy, this happens exactly in that moment, which you are not ready for. Exactly. Back to your or, or the, the question that you and uh, your yeah. members are more, more, most interested in the uh, credit finance. Yes. In credit, it's it's very logical that in in a, in striving in fighting for uh, for a client. In yes. trying to make uh, one more competitive, uh, there is a very natural phenomenon towards the tailor-made. That's solutions. what credit. That's what credit exists for. To make company, especially non-financial, in bank we got credit, which is product itself. When we when we speak about producer of goods and services, whatever it is, credit is an additional service which exists to make company more competitive to gain more competitive advantage and uh, i mean we all stay on, on this very narrow very very thin edge between over trading and under trading because under trading means less profits over trading means more bad debts uh, over the higher higher risk taking no one is able to trade to trade without taking risk this is absolutely clear. You know, I don't know about banking system. Uh, Mike, I got my own view on that, but it is not really uh, subject for today. But what 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 I got from my I don't know couple of decades of experience in trade credit and accounts receivable management is that 
no company can be competitive with a very low, with, with, with a very limited number of exceptions. I would say these are 10% of companies, or maybe 25% of companies, somewhere in that number, in that percentage. But uh, major, vast majority of companies have to take credit risk in order to become, to, to, to stay competitive, to continue to sell. But the biggest problem to me, and I will, I will try to, to give you that quite wide question in the end, but uh, I would like, well, I would like to see your, your opinion because the biggest problem to me in terms of risk assessment is not only related to country risk, corporations and companies do not pay too much attention to understanding of risk. Like if it is not quantified, there is no risk, like with the political risk, like with the country risk, like, I mean, there is quite a nice example of intercompany transactions. That was the, the, this question was raised sometimes by me, sometimes by my colleagues. Is there any, any risk in intercompany? People, you say, what risk in intercompany? These are our subsidiaries. I'm sorry, these are, these are two different companies located in two different countries. Uh, one of my colleagues used to say, when you're dealing with Coca-Cola, you're supposed to understand that Coca-Cola United States and Coca-Cola Timbuktu, these are two different companies and they bear different risks. And uh, very often, and what, um, what you know, makes me as much concerned as, as I am now is that um, on a higher level, there are too many decisions which are driven not by not by numbers, not by common sense. Okay, let, let me generalize. Not, not only numbers, but let, let's say not by common sense, but, but, but politics. What is more political right now? What is more important to please our stakeholders, our shareholders? Like, you know, after 2008 in 2009, you know, how many CEOs said to their shareholders that we were supposed to sell less? But that's what's supposed to happen. Every, you know, every shareholder community, every stakeholder expect that new CEO is, CEO is coming and will say, here is our way to growth. But I mean, common sense says that before we start growing, we're supposed to continue to go down. And what, I mean, we used to see that political decisions in the governments, in the economies, I mean, in the countries, in the, you know, whatever. But more and more, we could see that the same story is happening among corporations. I mean, my favorite, my favorite credit, credit risk expert, uh, Dr. Altman, simply said that there were so many signs that Enron will go bust, but no creditor I mean, withdrawn his credit facility. In the end of the day, they lost, I mean, total number, I think it is like 60 something, uh, 60 something billion dollars. The same story is happening with, uh, the same story is happening now with, uh, with the country risk and with, with, with economy, because obviously there was no real uh there was no real sign or maybe there was no strict prediction again about predictions P we, people human nature even for for the top authorities of companies you know make them think that prediction is a guarantee it's not a guarantee it's just a prediction we used to say okay if there is prediction this means that this something will surely happen at this exact moment i mean nobody can predict future i'm sorry that's impossible I mean, even with the computers, but um, e although COVID or impact, let's say impact of the COVID, the, the magnitude of COVID, maybe that was a difficult, that, that was difficult to predict, but at the same time, signs of coming, um, of coming recession were there. Yeah, absolutely. There absolutely. Were too many of them, and I think, there was no single economist, even, I mean, 
I, I don't call myself economist, but I mean, I, I, don't, I do believe that vast, vast majority, 90% of economists I know, I follow to, we are saying, ladies and gentlemen, near, I mean, still back, back in 2017 and 2018, there are signs of recession. And it is, it is coming just because the cycles of the economy, because of X, y, uh, A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z reasons. This is supposed to come with a very high probability, but everybody were believing in growth and you know this strict line. Mm -hmm. That's what makes me concerned, uh, not because we don't have instruments to predict uh, to predict negative scenarios. There are lots of instruments in, in nowadays, but who pays attention to them? So we are, I, I believe that the, the biggest issue in terms of risk is not about having or not having instruments. It's about risk culture. It's about the culture of understanding risk. What, what do you think about this? Absolutely, Andre. I fully agree with what you said, and I would like to complement what you said with two defenses. Mm -hmm. First one is the defense of the corporate financiers and uh, credit mm -hmm. risk people in the corporations. And the second defense is the defense of us economists. So first defense of the corporate financiers, why the understanding and attention paid to the macroeconomic risk and country uh, risk is uh, underplayed mm -hmm. because these things are like, you remember now the, the story of the uh, ever given this huge ship that got stuck in the oh, Suez yes. Canal. The problem with these big ships is that they move slowly and they navigate very slowly and they turn yeah. very slowly. But once you know you miss the thing by a couple of meters and you are stuck for for a moment. But navigating this big ship. It's not that easy, and that same same happens in the macroeconomics. So the changes in macroeconomics, unless you have a crisis like this pandemic, unless you have mm -hmm. a crisis like the uh, 152 years old Lehman Brothers imploding all of a sudden yeah. over the weekend, uh, in uh, except for these extreme scenarios. Uh, the changes in macroeconomics quarter to quarter, the macroeconomics data are reported on a monthly or quarterly basis. And these changes are very slow. So it's, it's very boring to pay attention to this minuscule, tiny shifts uh, in, in, in the macroeconomic uh, and uh, uh, the macro risk scenario. So for the people who are used to uh, daily, weekly, uh, monthly reporting, uh, these this, this changes are not that significant. And what you, what you mentioned at the, at the very beginning, this, that the risk is not something that uh, happens that quickly, and unless we speak about these worst case scenarios, it's more like this uh, frog, which if you uh, drop a frog into hot water, it jumps out. If you yeah. put a frog in the uh, cold water, and yeah. turn on the temperature very gradually, you actually Alertly. cook it because it, it stays there. And at a certain point, mo moment, it understands that it's in trouble, but it's yeah. already so paralyzed. It doesn't have the tools and the energy to rectify the situation. And that's exactly what should we should together, the economists, the country risk, the macroeconomic risk, the people together with the with the business, uh, people should uh, try to understand and avoid uh, this kind of uh, scenario. So I can fully understand if people don't have the passion to observe these minuscule changes and uh, to try to understand the reason for those very gradual changes and for their forecasting. And then the second defense, something that you have mentioned about the predictions. Yes, any prediction, any forecast is just an opinion. On the other hand, there are opinions and opinions. Uh, some of them are based on a different depth of analysis and data and all the considerations uh, are being paid attention to. But uh, I would like to point uh, the fact 
the way the, the same problem that we have with people being impatient about trying to mm-hmm. read and understand the minuscule changes at the beginning, minuscule changes, which then yes. eventually grow in amplitude as the problem uh, develops in macroeconomic developments. The same uh, problem we, ha- we have with uh, human psyche, especially in, in corporate finance, the two plus two is a four and there is one bottom line, <laughs> right? <laughs> you uh, you uh, on, the, on the balance sheet or on income statement, yeah. you are not supposed to uh, show more than one definite uh, number even though with, with some items, you know that there is a leeway for, you, you put in one single number, even though you know there is a scope for the number. In macroeconomics, it's absolutely different. There's no such thing, even when you measure macroeconomic variables, macroeconomic variables, you have a preliminary release and then you have a final release. And between these two, you do have, I mean, you accounting, accounting people would go crazy if they would uh, have to deal with, uh, with yeah. the way how we measure macroeconomic variables. And nevertheless, they do have a profound impact on what the corporations are doing. But the similar thing also goes with the forecasts. The forecasts are reported as a single number, which is nonsense because this sim- sim- single number that is being uh, yeah. uh, reported is the most likely scenario. But yeah. along that most likely scenario, we have a Gauss curve. We have a distribution of less likely scenarios up to this plus minus two sigma. Yes. What, what you see in that number of the f- forecasted number is yes. what is most likely to happen. What is most likely to happen is not what is possible to happen. And then the other thing, uh, and that's why when you pay attention to these minuscule changes and developments happening in in macroeconomic uh, uh, environment, it might not alter your most likely forecasted scenario, but it might be altering the width or these sigmas, what is possible to happen. So, and, and, and that's where this this illusion might come. So even though you have a forecast for the next five years, yes, and along that five year horizon, things are happening in 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 your economy, which do not give a cause to alter your the this this peak of the Gauss curve, this most yeah. likely scenario, but are causing the Gauss curve to change the shape, to becoming absolutely. Uh, more uh, wider. narrow or wider. Yes. And as it becomes wider, after the year two, all of a sudden, e- even if we imagine this very ideal world without the, the Lehman Brothers or uh, pandemics happening, yes. all of a sudden the, 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 the change in the shape of the curve uh, gives cause to, to switch to, to change in the, the most likely scenario, but you, you can't really blame the economists or you can, if, if you understand and if you read the macroeconomic forecasts yeah. with, with uh, this entire context, if, if, if you narrow da- down the macroeconomic forecast to this single number without understanding the, the context in which this number is uh, placed and the risks that are associated with this number, then you uh, and end up unjust, unjustly uh, blaming the, the macroeconomists for abruptly uh, changing uh, their forecast. So that's that's why it's it's worth understanding more than just the number, uh, the, the the forecasted number, but also the the context associated with with uh, that that number. Basically, same thing happens uh, also in uh, analyzing the political stability risk. Um, when when making opinion polls, uh, or opinion when when pe- people complain about the election results being different from the opinion polls, if you would watch not only this single number that's the most likely scenario, but also the plus minus uh, one or two sigmas of what might have mm-hmm. or the confidence intervals for that forecast. Uh, you might see that uh, actually what uh, the the eventual development of the reality 
even though mm -hmm. there is a popular joke about economists having this crystal ball uh, Please. it is it is as as uh, as, <laughs> as 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 pro as uh, as uh, uh, as uh, controversial as it is uh, yes. as i've mentioned it is it is it is possible to to forecast some of the developments and eventually the most successful corporate stories are exactly about that are exactly about making a long term big time bet uh, in the in the right direction at, at, at the right time yeah. I mean, uh, that, that's what Jim Collins says, productive paranoia. They are, they are preparing for worst case scenario and they are big and like, I mean, in his recent research, uh, that was 2013, great by choice, he says, the most, the, the company who were thriving in the hard times, simply having more cash than others on their balance sheet. They had like three times higher cash in the balance sheet. So they were simply ready to worst case scenario. I mean, they were more ready than others. And, uh, you know, you just mentioned that, uh, you know, that statistics and uh, I, I, I face this each time I work with corporates, especially with the financiers, uh, and it's very difficult to, to, you know, to change that mindset that accounting is about past and you know, precise numbers supposed to be left over there. And again, this is human nature. I used to do that you know, previous years myself. I used to extrapolate these precise numbers into the future. And then I was surprised why it doesn't work. I think, you know, I just, just created a joke that maybe we need different type of numbers for the past and for the future, you know, for the focus, because in the focus, there is no seven, there is no four. We're supposed to put this either tilde or whatever this, the, this sign is, simply saying this is always around N or this is it, it's somewhere around. Because one thing, one thing about future we're supposed to put in place as a, as a general rule, I think, is that nobody knows the future precisely. Nobody. Correct. Nobody is, uh, I mean, let, 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 I mean, that's, that's the, uh, I I'll always recall this and I'm always sure when people ask me about, you know, this um, stock trading, I always give them five minutes part of the wolf from Wall, from Wall Street, where Matthew McConaughey explains to young traders said, no one knows where equity will go. Warren Buffett, Jimmy Buffett, nobody knows, and brokers are the least in that. Nobody knows where, I mean, nobody knows the future. We can put the measures where it's supposed to be, or where, where it most likely to you know to to fluctuate but i mean it go it, it it is absolutely can go there back and so on and so on and so forth so i mean we can only do our best to predict and based on that and we we, we can but again if we do that we may see what are the most negative scenarios to us and we can uh, and then, then we can prepare ourselves. We, we cannot be prepared to all scenarios, but try our best to prepare for, for the most negative ones. We got a couple of questions before our last general question we go on to. Um, quite a nice question, by the way, very practical one. Uh, just to understand more that after COVID, the risk taking capabilities changed and we have to go back to the drawing board to, to the drawing board uh, back to basic what do you think about risk taking capabilities uh, one thing that i would like to underline and which is being downplayed uh, and something uh, that will be will 
uh, concern everybody, even though it's in the underplate yet, is uh, first, oh, what will happen to uh, the development of the inflation, uh, just because one effect of the COVID was the unprecedented combination of the three uh, demand uh, pump, uh, uh, demand factors being uh, put into economy, but not really uh, reflecting into development of the prices, which is extraordinary monetary stimulus. We have extraordinary fiscal stimulus. These two are not supposed to happen mm -hmm. at the same time, according to the textbook. On top of that, we have consumers sitting at home in quarantine, in many cases being able to continue to have their stream of income through telecommuting uh, or changed uh, arrangements, uh, home office working. And all this money, uh, once we are vaccinated, which will eventually happen mm -hmm. at a certain point, even though it's being delayed, at that point, that money will kick into the economy. Uh, the consequence is not that difficult uh, to, to, to predict. Uh, and then the second uh, thing, uh, speaking about the risk taking uh, or pre preparing for the, for, for the risk uh, capacity, capabilities, we live since 2008 pretty much for over a decade in unprecedented environment of zero or even negative interest rates basically now we have a we have a generation of financiers who ever since graduating have experienced nothing else than the zero interest rates not only in japan uh, yes. but also in the us and uh, europe and that might uh, change abruptly uh, at this point you know after the world war ii uh, interesting bit of our Central European experience was that the newly established governments preferred to hire for public offices people who were over 40, the older generation. Mm -hmm. The reason is that the older the person was, there was a higher probability that he might have actually experienced this democratic development before the war and could have yes. avoided going through the, the brainwash of on either of the sides during 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 the war war times if if there are any of the of these uh, financiers left mm -hmm. at this point it would be ideal to have back um, uh, the the generation which experienced the uh, second oil uh, oil shock in uh, 78 yeah. 79 after which the inflation spiked to double digit levels in the US and Paul Volcker did not hesitate and uh, fought that inflation with double digit interest rates. We, we, do have, we do have people who remember, well, we have people who experienced the double digit uh, in, in interest rates in the Turkey. We do have a, a generation of financiers who remember double digit uh, interest rates in Central and Eastern Europe, in, in, in Poland, Czech Republic, in, in Hungary. In Ukraine, uh, are again, still, uh, there, are, there are still such, 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 such rates. And uh, although uh, I live in Switzerland, I consult Ukrainian companies, and this is like different, different, different worlds. These are different ab worlds. Ab ab absolutely. I'm, I'm not saying that we, we, we will go into this worst case scenario. Uh, but, but again, operating in this zero interest rate environment for this long period of time might have, uh, as, as we have mentioned my, uh, in, in that example with the frog being boiled in, in, the, yeah. in the water, might have created certain new set of, the, of, of uh, risks on, on the corporate, corporate level both in terms of also even if we talk about the internal projects where one is not really calculating with this external risk-free rate even the internal projects have their uh, internal rate of return which has to be somehow mm -hmm. accounted for and in the zero interest rate environment uh, this uh, oh, profitability or, or return on investment uh, rate 
which makes sense is significantly skewed in favor of the projects which under more typical uh, conditions uh, never uh, be undertaken with, with all the uh, consequences that uh, come from that. So yeah, but first, and, and then last last comment regarding the, the health risk. Mm -hmm. The country that fared through the uh, COVID pandemic best was Taiwan. Obviously, there are some of the advantages which are not possible to be replicated, such as that it's, it's an island, it's mm -hmm. easy to uh, control or the influx and uh, of the people and uh, and and goods coming to to an island but one thing that can be replicated from the taiwanese story is that they remembered the sars outbreak in 2003 and again that's that's a very popular case why do uh, companies responsible for maintaining the roads uh, during the winter always get surprised by the first snow they don't get surprised. It's just that the, the rolling stock that they have for cleaning up the uh, streets from the snow is not calibrated for the worst case scenario. Because otherwise you would have unreasonable stock of machines sitting there for nine months waiting for those three months when they are needed in such a scale. Uh, so they have some optimal number and then by the time that they clear, clear, clear up the roads from the snow it takes it takes a certain time uh, but same thing in what they did in taiwan and again from the viewpoint of the efficient uh, use of capital it doesn't really make sense they had the infrastructure in the place ready for the sars outbreak of 2003 repeating it was not coming, it was not coming, it was not coming, it was not coming for 17 years. When COVID stri striked, there was no miracle about how, about the success that Taiwan had. Taiwan had this infrastructure ready mm -hmm. to address this sort of, it, it's not, not something unprecedented. We've, we've had it 100 years ago uh, with the Spanish flu after the World War I. Um, it's it's just uh, being being prepared for this this worst case uh, scenario. So uh, also in terms of this uh, this health risk, um, uh, this is something uh, worth uh, paying paying more attention to. Clear. Uh, thank you, thank thank you, Vladimir. I I mean from my side the answer is you know maybe would be less sophisticated and too primitive, but. In terms of risk, uh, you know, uh, you know, all these the events of the happening, which which happened over the last year, just to me, they, they simply shown that what majority of companies used to call credit management and risk management simply happened not to be, and it's just the right time to start managing credit, just the right time to start managing risk. Why that happened? Just because we used to think that you know, things we, we, we used to, to rely on things as a constant, yeah, constant low interest rates. Then one day they become higher, and then we we simply not prepared to that. But you know, every every single digit in the economy is actually variable over the time. It's not like constant. I, I, I used to ask, you know, sometimes I ask your colleagues when they when they provide lectures, they say liquidity is supposed to be 1.5, between 1.5 and 2. Where do you get 1.5 and 2? We get that from the previous, from the previous book, from then from 100 years ago. But let, let's look a little bit deep on that. And we're supposed to accept the world in general as a, uh, as, as, as much more complex as as we used to think they've got too many changes the, the number of changes supposed to be higher the mom the number of epochs supposed to be higher and we're supposed to develop much more complicated models to to you know to deal with that but i mean and this supposed not to be I mean, it, 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 won't, it won't become simpler there is good question about uh, payment terms um, 
how is COVID impacting the payment terms in general? And if there are any statistics provided showing changes in current average level of DSO per particular business type? Well, I, I try to answer myself then, Vladimir, if you wish to add something, I would say that credit terms will depend on every specific country. On my view, every, every pair like supplier and buyer is actually unique because one supplier takes a decision to maintain this supply chain, which generates cash for everybody and support and will having an ability to provide maybe from suppliers maybe from own uh, from own capital capacities one supplier will extend credit terms to his customer in order to maintain supply chain another one will cut credit terms in order to you know to to control their expenses and so on so the the general comment on what going what's going on now in the economy is that the the range of possible credit terms and DSOs become much more wide as it used to be. And since it became much more wider, the specific situation on a specific market, market becomes much more unpredictable. I, I mean, my general advice to my, uh, to my colleagues, just let's say, put more variables in, into the equation. It's not like, normal DSO or whatever credit term supposed to be 60 days. It's supposed to be variable. There are you know, many factors which are affecting credit term or payment term. And since the credit term is actually the main component in DSO, the main impacting component, the, 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 the range the, the of possible values of DSO is, is becoming bigger. Sorry for that wide answer. Maybe Vladimir will uh, will add something to that. Absolutely, Andre. I would just add to what you have said. Uh, the, uh, and again, a recurrent crisis. And again, it uh, the textbook theory says that uh, recessions happen in economies on average every seven to eight years. How? Uh, by stroke of luck, the past two crises have uh, taught us that it would be prescient to basically within a decade have a plan for at least one recession or one crisis within, within a decade. Uh, if, if one does that, uh, I dare to say he very likely can't do much wrong. But then what this crisis has taught us is um, and especially when it comes to the question about the payment terms. In a good times, we are all used to the best practice. We are all used to the IFRS treatment of the, uh, of, uh, the accounting aspect of the, the, of the payment terms. But in the crisis times, it comes to the point of what is possible, what is legally and regulatory possible. And at that point, this underplayed and sometimes overlooked aspect of the government effectiveness risk mm -hmm. and legal and regulatory risk comes in play, which means just to add to what, what Andre said, yes, in the crisis uh, from one common set of the best practices in payment terms, you end up with having really different pairs of, of uh, risk variables. And you can even have a countries which are on the same, let, let's say two countries within the Euro, uh, European mm -hmm. Union, right? Where the uh, Aquis community, I mean, the, the common framework should be very close, but then you have a different scope of the government effectiveness. How long does the, for example, the court proceedings take? Sure. At which point your, your counterparty doesn't take into account only the difference in the regulatory and legal terms, but also they simply will uh play very differently because they know from the moment that you sue them until you get the the, the result it can be very, rather variable between the even two countries within the the common common uh, block yeah. uh, so that that's why and, and uh, to put on that because of that uh significantly higher uh, transaction cost 
assessing all these risks is uh, associated with inevitably with, with higher cost. Because of that, that forces uh, us all go to go back to the drawing board and to reassess uh, the, the, the trading uh, terms and conditions uh, after the post-COVID crisis, apart from this uh, risks of the higher inflation, risk of higher interest rate, uh, risk of the different uh, behavior on the side of the corporates. Uh, very little is being spoken about Mm -hmm. And that's again, little dirty secret of this COVID crisis is we have this unprecedented fiscal stimulus being thrown at the economy and in many cases saving also the corporate sector, right? Sure. Well, guess what? Guess who's going to pay <laughs> for all that stimulus uh, as there is no free lunch uh, and pretty much in all the countries. Because now the focus in on, on fighting the pandemics, on achieving the high vaccination rates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very little attention is being paid to, for example, I tell it very bluntly, changes in VATs. Well, uh, uh, changes in, in corporate income taxes. There is a little discussion being open in Financial Times today where Joe Biden's administration is... Uh, opening the question, well, we all know that we have a problem with these tax havens. Let's close this loophole for good and globally by agreeing on a global level on minimum corporate income tax. Again, uh, for, for especially for anybody operating in multinational environment, that should ring a significant concerning bell. So yeah. Uh, Let's let's uh, be reminded also of these uh, items and these topics, which under normal in, in good times are absolutely neglected or uh, avoided, such as the government effectiveness risk, legal regulatory risk, um, etc. Yeah, because you know with tax, the COVID, tax policy tax tax policy risk is the is is the, tax, is the yeah. term. Yeah, because I mean, if we try to to combine only two themes now. Again, I'm just trying to say that, you know, we need to develop, I mean, the, the best way to cope with the coming future is to develop more complicated thinking than we used to. I mean, more complex, the, 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 more, the more, more complex uh, uh, models uh, and, and try, try, first of all, but again, first of all thinking, that's the conclusion I came to. Uh, and uh, if we just try to try to quantify the impact of COVID, and then uh, we try to uh, try to assess the the impact of COVID on the economy, and all these decisions made by government, this become not only politically controversial. This becomes actually very complex issue. We got actually last question today, and this is already mentioned by our audience. Um, if we put ourselves, or if we try to walk a mile in the shoes of the company or business practitioner, let's take a company which is exporting, let's say to 10 different countries. Ob just as obvious, this company is supposed to pay attention to countries. And it's very difficult to find a person which would have, um, which would have capacities of economist. And on the other side, if we put into that into that corporate role an economist who is predictable to assess countries and so on and so on, this person would be quite difficult to manage business because business requires different type of capacities. The thing is, how can we, I don't say assess, but because that was a question about country scoring. Uh, what are the tools which may give such a practitioner or let's say general business practitioner um, kind of indications or set of monitoring tools to at least see whether or not this country let's let's put it simple way good or bad 
um, we, we, we can put it like, okay, if this, comp if this country is good or bad to deal with, you know, to, to do business with, whether or not the company in this country will be reliable or not. And uh, again, what is the, let's say, very simple practical ways to assess? I know actually two things. Let, 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 let me make your life see simply today. <laughs> Uh, mainly, we are talking about ratings. Sometimes we take ratings, country ratings or country credit ratings, although they are not given to country, they are given to, to issue of, uh, of securities. But again, my understanding of country rating or credit rating for such like given by either big three agencies or insurance company who puts their, you know, who add their skin into the game because they really take these business decisions on that. But to my understanding, ratings are a quintessential of a good economist already did good job and simply give us, uh, give us, um, give us a rating as a final result. On top of that, we can always add to the rating, the watch list or the trend or the focus. And plus to that, just using this very simple, uh, very simple um, tool, we can also see the trend, which trend is already a good prediction, although not very precise one. And then in addition to that, or in parallel to that, there are credit default swaps rates, which are less popular, less clear among practitioners, but they are still giving us an indication. There are also, I would say, because, I mean, people are asking about the credit scoring and uh, I mean, country risk scoring. I don't believe scoring in, in very general is good for decision-making in terms of country risk, but in terms of monitoring, it is inevitable. Again, CDS, got scale of, of the price for, the, for, for, for their price, which predict negative scenario. And to me, it is much more, I would say much more recent. No, no, I don't say it is more precise or less precise, but you know, this growth, I mean, they, the, the update of CDS happening much more often than, than credit risk of countries. So this is supposed to be also a good tool in addition, but what's your opinion for the final of today's discussion about the tools? What, obviously having bad predictions, then we need to investigate further or maybe ask opinion of economists, something like mm -hmm. that. But for the managing of, let's say receivables portfolio, what are the tools? Maybe you, you, you know something, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, be, I believe you know something better than me, but that's what people use. What else can be used maybe? Sure. Uh, so uh, this is rather broad and uh, intricate question uh, worth a separate thesis or a separate webinar at least. Yeah. No, so I'll try to be very brief. Absolutely. The big three, so-called uh, Standard Poor's, Moody's and uh, Fitch mm -hmm. ratings are uh, brilliant. Their huge advantage and disadvantage at the same time is that they need to have a uniform set of scales for all the countries worldwide. Basically, these big three ratings are like the McDonald's cuisine. With the Big Mac index, you know, the price of the Big Mac across the world is yeah. a very useful tool because, you know, it measures the price of pretty much almost uniform product worldwide uh, but uh, again uh, it has its inevitable limitations the minimum of which is that the ratings usually are uh, reassessed on an annual uh, basis uh, and, and 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 also they tend the changes in the ratings are exactly like this big container ships the rating agencies don't make any sudden moves uh, they do change the outlook first, then they do a one or one notch up or down uh, change, which is again an advantage. The, the, the big container ships are supposed, and that's something that you expect uh, them to be uh, to be predictable in their moves. 
uh, except when the external environment changes in that part of the world or when the crisis uh, strikes. So other than that, on a biannual uh, basis, it's worth watching the World Bank and uh, International Monetary Fund within the Europe, the European Commission, much underplayed tool are the spring and autumn forecasts of the European Commission, which on a semi-annual basis give, uh, again, the changes, that, that's the problem with the macro, macro figures, the more frequent the, the assessments are, the changes are less discernible, uh, less easy to identify. Uh, so this would be on a more uh, frequent basis. Uh, and uh, in terms of the data uh, availability, cross-country comparable data availability, there is a very useful data tool uh, in the IMF uh, data bank uh, and OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Yeah. But then exactly as you, as you mentioned, basically, in the banking sector, in this old uh, good banking sector in Frankfurt or in London, uh, every single bank has its proprietary assessment of the of the country risks. As I've mentioned, that's something also that, that the reinsurers uh, are doing, the big reinsurance uh, groups. Uh, CDS are very useful. CDS is something what I call 30 second sort of analysis. That's something that uh, any practitioner should look at uh, first. The, the risks with CDS is the liquidity of, of those markets. Uh, in CDS markets, the short term abrupt changes are possible, which again, they, they do have, as Andre mentioned, uh, the advantage that they are almost real time assessment of the a country uh, risk, uh, but they also are susceptible to abrupt uh, shock uh, changes. And then there is a plethora of uh, private uh, providers of the analysis, including, I don't want to make advertisement, but obviously we all know the Economist Intelligence Group uh, with their relatively regular uh, assessment of the, the country risk. And there is a uh, uh, Ehi's Global Insight, Oxford Analytica, mm -hmm. uh, the groups like Eurasia, Eurasia groups. Uh, it's it's worth having having a relationship with also uh, at least one of those big uh, official multinational providers and some of these smaller uh, Teneo group, for example, uh, in London, in Brussels, uh, small private uh, private uh, corporations or private private research and analytical analytical units or consultancies very good uh, vladimir i so just to in terms of practice we can i mean we can use as many i mean the good things about ratings and about uh, CDS rates, they are publicly available for free. There is no need to buy them and to monitor them, we, we, we can use it. And then in order to, whenever we see like negative change or whenever, whenever we make a big decision, it is always good to ask for advice or deeper view from the professional economist, which would be my advice as well. Absolutely. Uh, one um, uh, disclaimer, you know, yes. this yes. Eight, uh, eight points font disclaimer to what you exactly have said. Sometimes it's just worth uh, to utilize the internal resources. Any multinational corporation has people in the field across the globe. And I've been recently approached by one of these in the field person who uh, who was attending one of the HR conferences where I was giving lecture two years ago. It was a person from the big multinational corporation, which was actually running uh, an internal selection process about where to place their new facility. Quite a big, big investment uh, that was announced just this year. And at that, that point, I just, from the top of my head, mentioned some of the arguments, some of the sources for their uh, internal corporate decision 
uh, making, which in the end, now after two years, we, we can see that did play play a role. Uh, so uh, it's it's worth. Uh, I mean, obviously there is a bias among the internal resources, but but the the, the pe people in the field might know the external external providers or assessors that might contribute with uh, worthwhile uh, points of view. And uh, second, uh, as, as, as I've mentioned during our discussion, you know, the forecast or the rating, it's just this one most likely scenario uh, that's in the middle of the Gauss curve. So it's always worth knowing also the story. Yeah. At, at, at minimum, I mean, if you are very number-minded a person, when you hear a forecast, you should ask the, the forecast is always this middle of the Gauss curve. You need to ask about the skewness uh, and the uh, width and depth of, uh, of that curve, um, sigma uh, of, of, of that forecast, the confidence interval. Uh, so settling with a single number when it comes to the opinion about the future development is simply uh, not enough. Even the very number-minded uh, controlling type of credit manager should be careful and should solicit uh, these other parameters uh, surrounding the, the opinions about the future developments and risks. I do thank you very much for today's discussion. And uh, I, believe, I believe audience shares my pleasure of having so many, so many good advices, so many views uh, we received today. Uh, I believe this discussion is not the last one. We will, you already mentioned that uh, we might have another big discussion about ratings and stuff like that. So I, I will try to organize something for the future. And uh, thank you very much for today. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, see you next time. See you. Bye bye. Thank you for your invitation. Have a nice day. Enjoy thank the you, Easter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.